Good morning. My name is Michelle Polkar, and I am the CHCI CVS Health Graduate Fellow. And I'm delighted to be with you today for this uh, Leading the Way, Amplifying the Voices and Health of Disabled Community breakout session. Uh, according to the University of New, Hampshire, New Hampshire's Institute of Disability, more than 5.4 million Hispanics, about 9% of all ages, indicated having some form of disability in the 2020 U.S. Census. Moreover, Latinos with disabilities experience multiple barriers in accessing care, including, but not limited to, language barriers, cultural stigma, lack of health coverage, etc. In today's conversation, our esteemed panelists will address these barriers and highlight the work that healthcare providers and Latino leaders are doing to ensure inclusivity for those living with disabilities. On behalf of CHCI, I would like to welcome you all, and it is an honor to introduce the chair for this panel, Representative Jim Langevin. Congressman Langevin is a senior member of the House Armed Services Committee on which he chairs the Cyber, Innovative Technologies, and Information Systems Subcommittee, and serves on the subcommittees on Sea Power and Projection Forces and Strategic Forces. He is a strong advocate for inclusion and independence for people with disabilities and helped pass the ADA Amendments Act that strengthened the protections of Americans with Disabilities Act. Langevin has championed passage of a bipartisan bill to expand services for families caring for their elderly and disabled loved ones. And now, let's view the introductory welcoming video remarks from the chair of this panel, Representative Jim Langevin. Hi, everyone. I'm Congressman Jim Langevin from the 2nd Congressional District of Rhode Island. And I'd like to thank the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute for hosting today's event focused on improving the health of the disability community. You know, it's so important that we have these discussions as there are millions of people with disabilities striving to live independent lives in their communities. Unfortunately, the reality is that many of them can't due to insufficient supports and services. Making matters worse, many of these inequities disproportionately impact Latinos with disabilities. That's why we must follow through on President Biden's plan to expand home and community-based services so that all people with disabilities can receive the care that they need in the setting of their choice. We also need to adjust federal benefits programs, including Medicaid, so that people with disabilities who enter the workforce don't lose their health care benefits when they earn a salary over a certain threshold, leaving them without the very services that enable them to work in the first place. So these are just a few of the examples of the many steps that we must take to achieve health equity and facilitate independent community living. As the first quadriplegic ever elected to the United States Congress, these issues are very personal to me. And my desire to fix them is part of the reason why I founded the Bipartisan Disabilities Caucus, which serves as a forum for members of Congress and their staff to learn more about these important issues. And I'll mention that we're always taking on new members, so I encourage all uh, members uh, of the House to join. So please reach out to your member of Congress and ask them to join. And with that, I just want to say thank you once again for your commitment to these issues and for inviting me to participate in today's event. Thank you, Congressman Langevin, for your insights and steadfast effort to amplify the voices and health of the disabled community. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to today's moderator, Armando Contreras. Armando Contreras was hired as a new president and CEO of United Cerebral Palsy Corporation in 2017. UCP is the leading national organization that advocates for resources for individuals with cerebral palsy and other disabilities as well as their families and their communities. Prior to his current role, Armando served as the Arizona Hispanic Chamber of Commerce President and CEO. Armando also served as a member of former Governor Janet Napolitano's cabinet and as director of the Arizona Registrar of Contractors. He was also honored to serve as executive director of the Governor's Council on Small Businesses, which formulated recommendations for Governor Napolitano in marketing and outreach access to financial capital, workforce development, and affordable health care for small businesses. Please welcome moderator today, Armando Contreras. Thank you, everybody. Uh, among a more important accomplishment for me is that uh, I'm a dad of three beautiful children, Andrea, Armando, 
and Andrew and been married for, for 35 years to, to my wife, Norma, and I, I consider that's probably the, my most significant accomplishment, and I hope I continue to be the good dad and the good, good husband. So good morning to you. I'm honored really to be here and to be invited to CHCI, um, and I'm also honored and blessed to be among these great panelists that have done significant work with the disability community. Um, United Cerebral Palsy, I work here in Washington, D.C., and we have 58 affiliates in the United States that provide direct services to children and adults that have cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, autism, developmental delays, um, IDD, and other, other types of conditions. We also have two affiliates in Canada. So again, a great honor that I am here. I wanna also thank uh, Representative Congressman Jim Langevin for his opening remarks and for his commitment and dedication to the disability community and Michelle and CHCI, for, again, for this timely summit um, that really we need to have this conversation specifically too after we've gone through and we continue to go through through COVID. So before we get started with our panel discussion, I just wanna give just an overview here of the discussion. One out of every six Latinos live successfully and healthy lives while navigating society with an apparent or invisible disability which is comparable to other American demographics. Yet in the past year, one in three 18 to 44 year old disabled adults face unmet healthcare needs due to inequities in our nation's healthcare system. Disadvantages that disproportionately impact disabled Latinos, Latinx. In this session, we'll be examining uh, some vi variations of our healthcare system and how he healthcare providers and Latino leaders are working to build inclusive communities for people living with disabilities. And I'd like to remind you, if you wanted to share this um, in social media, it's the hashtag, hashtag CHCI Summit. And then at the end of the panel session, I understand that um, somebody will have a mic and we'll go to you, correct? Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll go to you to ask any any questions that you that you might have. Um, so, with that said, I'm I'm delighted to be joined again by the three experts, distinguished experts in this topic. So, I first want to have them introduce themselves to you before we we begin the dialogue. So, to my to my immediate left. Um, I want, want Alexander Castillo. Um, Alex, if you can go ahead and introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, my name is, as you said, Alexander Castillo. Um, a little bit about myself and then what I do. So I'm originally from the Dominican Republic. Uh, both of my parents are or have been in the kind of health care field. So my father, a social worker, my mother, a guidance counselor in New York City. Uh, currently, I work for the Department of the Bond and Vision Impaired as a rehabilitation instructor. Uh, and what that means is I provide direct services to uh, blind, deafblind, low vision Virginians in their homes uh, in regards to accessibility. Uh, so maybe it's relearning how to use a computer again after losing vision or, you know, getting access to hearing aids after losing hearing uh, and, you know, and a and vision as well. Um, or it could be a referrals for services like vocational rehabilitation, so that helps with people going back to work um, and uh, maintaining kind of employment. So there's, you know, um, all of those types of services that kind of go around and uh, blindness and visual impairment and deaf blindness. So that is, uh, that is what I do. I know I have four minutes, but um, I'm going to pass it on because I think that, you know, unless there's something specific, that should encompass. Yeah. Alex, thank you. We really appreciate that. Um, next is Dr. Lisette Torres. Uh, thank doctor? You. Thank you. Um, Dr. Lisette Torres. I am 
a research scientist at Turk, which is a math and science education research nonprofit. Um, my work is focused primarily on race, racialized gender justice and disability in STEM. And I'm also um, a founder of the National Coalition of Latinxes with Disabilities. Uh, we're also known as CNLD, and our acronym actually is the Spanish acronym. So Coalición Nacional para Latinos con Discapacidades. And I identify as a disabled Latina. I have a non-apparent disability of fibromyalgia, which essentially causes pain throughout the body and fatigue and hopefully not today, but something called fibro fog, which essentially um, kind of traps my thoughts in my head and it does, I don't articulate myself very well. So hopefully that won't happen on this panel today. Um, I'm also a sibling of disabled um, Latinas. So my sisters have the same condition and my mom is legally blind. <clears throat> so she has retinitis pigmentosa. Yeah. <laughs> Alex is like, yes. Yeah. Um, and so, um, I've been doing um, disability advocacy for, I would say, the past um, officially since 2016, since the founding of this organization. Um, but I've been, um, unbeknownst to me, I've been within the disability community for longer than that, way longer. Um, and I guess with that, I'll pass it on to the next speaker. So I, j I just wanted to say, uh, Dr. Torres, thank you for, for being here. And um, she did ask me that for the rest of the panel session that I call her Lisette. So, so know that it's not, <laughs> I'm not doing this as a disrespect, but she, she said, I want you to call me Lisette instead of Dr. Torres, see? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll do that. And our, our next panelist, uh, Ajilsa Fernandez, who's here with us too. Ajilsa? <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me here. It is a pleasure to share space with you all. Um, I also live with a uh, disability, psychosis, and I'm also a Dominican descendant uh, from the Dominican Republic, El Sitio. <laughs> and I am a mental health disability advocate and consultant. So basically, I work and have worked with companies and organizations on disability and mental health policies, feedback, movies, and so forth. I've worked with companies such as Lionsgate, Facebook, and Verizon. So that's a, a little bit about me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I, had, I had a couple of minutes to meet with our distinguished panelists for a little bit of coffee. And uh, one of the things that came up is that we were talking about what we missed the most during COVID. And what came up was the hugs and besitos. Yeah. So I um, want to let you know is that we hope that that happens soon along the way when all of this is, is finalized. So let's begin our session today with, uh, with the question here. And any of the panelists can answer this. But how did COVID-19 impact the Latino Latinx community with disabilities? And any one of you can, can start. Don't all go at once. <laughs> I can. I guess I can start. Um, so, Lisa, um, I will go ahead um, first. Um, so, in terms of the disability community, um, beyond just obviously the um, challenges with with COVID illness and um, morbidity uh, that we have seen. Um, we saw, at least through the National Coalition of Latinxes with Disabilities, we noticed growing isolation within the community. And so um, our organization, we're 100% volunteer, and our mission is to advocate and educate the Latino community about disability. And we thought, well, you know, we, we can no longer meet in person 
So how best can we reduce isolation within our community? And so we started actually a web series of conversations called Nosotros or Us. Um, basically, it is, we're going to continue it uh, starting in June, but the conversations during the pandemic were conversations around uh, issues within the disability community that of, were of concern to Latinos and disabled Latinos in particular um, that had to do with the pandemic. So we had, um, basically we would have a guest speaker, they would present a little bit about a topic of concern and then we would open the floor up uh, for the disability, for our disabled Latino community to um, voice their experiences, concerns, questions. So we talked about mental health, we talked about um, self care, we talked about um, parents with uh, disabled children, we talked about siblings. Um, we talked about science communication and what does science communication mean for the Latino community generally, but also for the disabled Latino community in terms of this pandemic. And so that's probably something that'll come up a bit um, as we talk. Uh, but that essentially was our focus during the pandemic was just letting the disabled Latino community know that we were here that we were there to help them through this uh, pandemic moment and to try to get them the information that they needed. And I guess I'll hop right in. <laughs> uh, there was various ways that the Latina community was impacted. Um, one was the lack of access to treatment. Uh, the CDC released uh, data on this where um, till this day, uh, Latinx community has been highly disproportionately impacted by not being provided monocloid antibodies. And just as recent as April, the CDC released another research that demonstrated that um, the Latinx community doesn't have access to booster. Only 15% in comparison to 60 something percent of white folks are um, have their booster. And this is not because the vaccine doesn't exist, but the lack of access and um, not being able to talk directly to the community and oh, so many things around there. Um, housing, uh, disproportionately, Latin A community are facing eviction today. And in New York State particularly, and this is gonna happen in other states where rights to counsel exists. Um, right now in New York State, rights to counsel, just to explain, is where folks of low income can receive the lawyer. And this means that they have uh, equitable and fair rights in their trial or when they go to court. So they, this right it exists in New York and in other states. In New York, that's being totally disregarded. So we expect that Latin community are going to be displaced at a high disproportion. And then um, the Latin community as well, when they enter the hospitals, and this is across hospitals na nationally, um, when they enter the hospital, they did not have translators. So on top of folks having a disability where housing is very challenging to get when you have certain disabilities, and on top of you not able to speak English, you don't have a translator, you now have a disability as well. So you're being displaced from your home, which is probably the one apartment that you found after years of searching that's accessible. You're entering the hospitals and you can't express that you have the right to a support person. This means that a person with disabilities has the right, not nationally, but in many states, they have the rights to a support person, meaning that although COVID is in place, you have the rights to bring in somebody to the hospital with you. <clears throat> this could be because you may have communication challenges or um, other needs where you need an assistance. And because the person cannot communicate in English, they can't even request 
for their rights to be respected. So there's much challenges there. And then with the vaccine, again, so not only can you not speak English, so many of the facilities that were administering the vaccine, again, they didn't have translators. They did not have folks to say, hey, come through this line or that line where folks are able to understand the information. If we go even further and we speak about the immigration status, a lot of the Latin community um, did not know that they can get the vaccine mm -hmm. due to fear of ICE. So again, because they didn't have the translator, they didn't have someone to make them feel safe and say, hey, you can sign up without providing your ID and your information and so forth. Mm -hmm. So there's been an enormous challenge within our Latin community. And if we were to talk about um, intersections of the LGBTQ community, lesbian, bisexual, and gay community, and the transgender, gender nonconforming community, that's even a higher disproportion when we talk about the Latin community, because now folks can't go to a place that respects their pronouns, that has access to gender neutral bathroom. So the, the access to healthcare and the barriers that exist, the access is reduced and the barriers are increased because now um, someone doesn't probably know the language has a disability and also identifies at this intersection where they face multiple discrimination. Um, <clears throat> I want to just add to the to that, which is, you know, specifically in the blindness, low vision, and uh, deafblind communities, you've got all of these issues that were just mentioned, and on top of that, you had the issue of just most of this communication about COVID and about resources being online. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and most and a lot of these uh, websites, whether they're the state or federal, were not accessible. And some of them are still having trouble with accessibility. So what do I mean by not accessible? I mean that as a blind or low vision person, you could go online and you could say, you know what, mommy, I'm going to help you out because I'm the only one that speaks English in our household. I'm going to sign you up for services. Oh, wait a second. I actually can't because somebody didn't do the work to make the website so that it can function with something like a screen reader mm -hmm. or a magnifier or something like that. Um, another thing is, is transportation. A lot of these um, resources were resources that were provided to people that were driving it made the assumption that everyone was able to drive to either get a vaccine, to get a test. Um, so even if you somehow, as a blind person, managed to sign up, then you had to figure out how do you get to that trans how do you get to that what you know to that place, uh, that brick and mortar uh, place where you can get a vaccine or where you can get tested or where you can get more information or even how do you access issues of housing. A lot, of, a lot of these places just had a phone number and said, call. And you would call uh, during the height and maybe mid-COVID uh, season, and you just get a phone number. You just get a message. We'll call you back in three days. Never called you back. Um, I, I hope I have not <laughs> made you sad or, or, you know, but this is not, you know, these issues are not issues that probably are going to make you go home and, and make you feel good. You know, so this is tough conversations. Thank you. Um, and in addition to what was um, said, um, there's, there are policies in hospitals throughout the United States um, called standards of care. And in the standards of care policy, that's when they decide as a hospital who's going to get the ventilator or who's not going to get a ventilator when the ventilators are all taken. And in some states, people with disabilities were not even part of that totem pole. That's so, true. so those we were United Cerebral Palsy was in the um, ad advocating for states to relook at these policies that were important because they're life or death policies. Um, thank you for for answering and and um, for that dialogue on that question. Um, the next one is. Um, how does the lack of comprehensive data with regards to Latinos 
in the disabilities community affect the community's ability to access services <coughs> or treatments. One, one note is United Cerebral Palsy has a report called Case for Inclusion. And one of the, the challenges that we had while, while I've been there for five years was that I wanted to add in that, uh, in that report for this year, for 2022, and you can access that at ucp.org, is that what was the effect of Latinos or people of color um, that have disabilities, and even the people of color who are serving um, the disability community, and the data was hard to find. It was hard to find. Um, so there are certain universities that are just beginning to look at that. So I wanna ask the panelists is that, um, how, how does that affect when we have very little data, or in some cases even zero data, why aren't the universities paying attention? I guess I can kick it off. <laughs> so um, in terms of data, I know with disability, the challenge is uh, disclosure. So a lot of studies or data collected about disability it has to do with the individual volunteering that information. And unfortunately, a lot of um, people in the disability community who can pass um, will elect not to share that they have a disability for fear of stigma. Um, disability, even within the Latino community, um, the stigma is, is real. Um, and so we don't want to be discriminated against. And so for, you know, a lot of the data that's being collected, we may not share that part. And like Adilsa and I were talking about earlier, like some of our Latino community don't recognize their impairment as a disability. So there's also that conversation within our communities in terms of identification of disability, but also um, reducing the stigma. Uh, related to that is a lot of the data that we collect about Latinos in general um, is usually aggregated. We're all just one mass of Latino, <laughs> which, uh, which of course bothers, bothers us because you know we have two proud Dominicans up here and a Puerto Riqueña. And you know those um, migration histories, those differences in um, our backgrounds kind of just get coalesced into one category. And so what we're hoping is that data will begin to, um, people will collect data that can be disaggregated by more than just race and gender. Um, Related to data and the disability community though, um, what is the purpose and who's gonna benefit from this data? Um, I think a lot of times, especially communities of color, we're wary of data collection because of the history of uh, colonial scientific um, um, abuses about you know researchers coming in collecting information about us and then not sharing it with us and so what our organization the national coalition of latinxes with disabilities would like is for disabled latinos in particular to begin to collect this information about our communities um, and to share it with, with others. But beyond that, I know Adilsa has a lot to say about what do we do with the data after we get it? Um, that's a big question. And so um, I'll let my two panelists kind of expand upon that. Yeah, <laughs> like Lisette said, um, I, I won't touch up on why it's not being collected or how much is being collected. <coughs> But what do we do with that data? Um, as I mentioned earlier, the CDC has released reports that demonstrate that the Latin community has been highly impacted by COVID-19 and at a disproportionate rate, whether it's housing, the vaccines, the boosters, the treatment. The question is, what do we do with that data? Time and time and time again, we do have the data, but nothing much is being done. We had the data that there was barriers that existed, 
when the vaccine was distributed. Why was the nation not prepared for the booster? Happened right back again. So we basically did nothing with the, with the previous data. The same thing with the treatment. We knew that during the monoploid um, antibodies at, um, timing, there was a high disproportion of distribution to the Latinx community. Here we are with Paxlo, the antiviral medications that are being distributed. Who doesn't have access? The Latin A community. We should have been prepared. So the question is, um, when we gather the data, what are we going to do with that data? Oftentimes what we find is that those in power are, I'm gonna just say it, are white people with power. <laughs> And so we are time and time and time, and by we, I say the Latin community excluded. And so we need to ensure that after the data is collected, there is diversity in that power. It is vital because the, if the data is collected, but the power is unevenly distributed, then the decision making is always going to have the same turnaround. I'm just gonna add something really quick to that. What does that look like? To me, what that kind of representation and the power of data collecting and, and policy making is, you know, if, if whoever is sitting in front of that, uh, you know, statistical program, uh, putting together uh, the data and analyzing does not know the community that they're analyzing and that they're interpreting for in terms of data. How are we gonna have programs that actually benefit that community? Right. You know, um, that, that's it for me. And I would just add real quickly, I, a good example of a good way to do it um, is <clears throat> uh, Monica Felu Mohel, uh, from Ciencia Puerto Rico. She did an amazing campaign on the island called Aquí Nos Cuidamos, where they worked with community members on the ground and especially with the deaf community to create inclusive science communication uh, videos and websites and news reports. Like they... They were on the radio almost every day talking about the pandemic, talking about ways to prevent it, talking about the data and making it accessible. And I think that's something that's sorely missing is inclusive science communication that's talking about science information not only to English speakers, but to Spanish speakers, to deaf and hard of hearing, to all the disability community um, in accessible language that we can all relate to. That's culturally relevant. Thank you. To Ajitsa's point, uh, Dr. Bonalyn Swenner of John Hopkins University, who likes to say, who counts depends on who is counted. And he talks about data oppression a phenomenon involving the unwillingness or disinterest in gathering health data about communities of color. In some instances, as occurred early in the pandemic, data is ga gathered but not properly disseminated or made available to researchers or healthcare providers, which she refers to as data keeping, data gatekeeping. So um, yes, that that is, um, that is very much alive and true. The next question is, the Biden administration likes to tout the fact that there is a slate of White House appointments that has been most diverse in the US history. Has this made a difference with regards to equity issues that impact Latinos with disabilities? I, I see okay, smiles. Go. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to pass on that question. Yeah, all right, all I'll right, pass okay. on that question. Yeah. So, um, yes and no. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So, 
having, and we mentioned this with the, with the data, having representation matters. It not only matters for the next generation that's upcoming and they see us at the table and say, it's doable, I can too, but it matters also because we were what we were talking about, data collection or access to hospital or, ha or <coughs> access to treatment. It's a community that truly understands what's happening on the ground and is able to communicate with others um, at the table and make decisions with power. <laughs> so it does matter. And we've seen that with Alexandra Cortez. Alexandra Cortez comes back to that table with power and says, this is how the Latin community is being impacted. This is how you can fix things. Um, and no, it, it um, just having people at, of color at the table doesn't change things. If one predominantly the table with power is white, two, and we've seen this time and time again, we are tokenized. People of color are tokenized. You can talk, but first, let me finish as a white person. You can share that idea, but mine's is much more important. Uh, you can share that data, but my views are still stronger. And until the table makes space and actually is concerned for diverse communities and how diverse communities are impacted, things are not gonna change because that's part of systematic barriers systematic racism, systematic discrimination. So that must change in addition to having people of color at the table. I agree with the Jilsa. And I would also add, um, so the Biden administration, yes, representation is important. They are doing what they can. However, as of this morning, we're still seeing uh, one of the highest um, arrests or detentions at the border that we've seen historically in the United States. And I think we don't talk about how migration from those countries, possibly due to the pandemic, possibly due to um, economic and social challenges in their countries, can be disabling. Um, there are folks coming to the border because of disability, disability needs, or they are developing disabilities as they're traveling their way here. And then on top of that, they're placed in detention centers, which I would argue is disabling. It's a traumatic experience that can lead to mental health challenges. And so I would say that if we're talking about disability in the Latino community, we also have to acknowledge that we have brothers and sisters, we have familia who are in detention centers right now who may have impairment needs, access needs, medical needs that are probably not being taken care of like they're supposed to? Um, I said I'm going to pass on that question. <laughs> so I am going to pass on the, you know, Joe Biden administration piece. But just to speak, um, just to speak to the last point, um, we should be looking for individuals that are going to remove barriers. So if, again, I'm speaking as a state employee, uh, a question on maybe on an intake that may shoo people away, that may, pe you know, may people a little bit nervous, you know, um, like those kind of things. Like we need a little bit of awareness of, for example, how do you ask if you want to register to vote, how do you, you know, are you, are you able to do it without putting pressure on somebody to provide, give, you know, maybe give information they're not comfortable with? in terms of immigration status, or no, I'm not able to vote, or no, I've, I'm, you know, ex, you know I, I've been in, in prison or something like that, um, which does happen. Um, and I say that because some people, not a lot, but I've seen them kind of shy away from the services that they need 
just because maybe somebody at the top that was creating these intakes and forms and things like that was not really able to um, touch into the community and see like, hey, is that the way we should be asking those things? So, okay, yeah. Thank you. Um, before we, I get into really one of the final questions is like, what are the solutions to every, everything that we've talked about? Um, I picked this, this question here because I think it's really important. Um, acknowledging that there's more than one Latino culture, what are some of the culture pros and cons which regard to Latinos with disabilities? And, and let me begin with one thing that, that I've been very much aware of in many years is that in our community, um, early detection, um, early intervention has been a problem because some of our families are not educated to take their children in um, and looking at those possible um, issues that, that infants have. Sometimes they believe, well, you know, our, our, our little girl or our boy um, needs a little bit more time. She or he will eventually walk. Oh, you know, it's not a big issue. And then the issue ev evolves two, three, four, five years later. And when that could have been paid attention to, that's one. And then the other, and really in a, in a smaller community and, and those that perhaps need a bit more education is the taboo. You know, um, you know we were cursed, right? Um, we did something. Um, you know, we shouldn't take our child out there because the folks are gonna, our community is gonna believe that there's a taboo in our family's curse. So anyways, those are a couple of things. I know there's many more, but I'll turn it over to our, our panelists. Um, I, I guess I'll start since I was shaking my head so vigorously. Um, I, I would say in terms of disability, um, one is, I think, so I think Latinos pride themselves on familia, on being caregivers, on making sure, or at least, you know, generally, you know, we, we believe as a community in caring for family. And when it comes to disability, it's good and bad. Um, good in the sense that we want to um, take care of that person, make sure they're okay, make sure that they're navigating the world um, and, and no, no harm comes to them. But on the other hand, it gets to the point where you don't let your disabled family member experience the world and to be able to navigate independently. And for a lot of disabled people, you know, they're, they're, they become isolated and they stay at home all the time and the only people they may talk to may be their family. And so thinking about disability identity and thinking about what does it mean as a Latino community to create a Latino disability identity, what does that look like? How can we make our disabled Latino families members feel um, proud of their disability, I think that's a conversation that still needs to be had. Like Armando was saying, we, um, we, some folks see it as a curse or as something that can be prayed away or, you know, or you're the family member that nobody really talks about, <laughs> but like everybody knows that you're the family member with a disability, you know? Um, and so we, we, we don't talk about it openly. And I think um, having conversations like this is a starting point. Yeah. Uh, uh, you wanna go ahead? Yeah, oh, I've, I've been going last, so I'll, figure <laughs> I'll go, yeah. So um, I think that one of the um, advantages that our community, specifically the, in general, I think, is that as Latinx, Latinos, Hispanics, you know, whatever generational uh, group you're in and identifies with, with you know, the name, um, we like to communicate. And one of the ways that we communicate 
is with word of mouth. And so mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of this information is probably not going to hit as hard coming from a pamphlet, especially, you know, talking about, you know, um, just going back to the, you know, making, including the family member or, you know, feeling included as somebody with a disability in the Latin yeah. community. But it's going to come from, you know, just conversation. How do you spend time with people? Are people open to spending time with you? Does your church, uh, our community organizations, are they accepting of you? Um, and because we love to talk, I think that's one of the things that we can talk about and openly discuss. Um, it's, a, it's a personal issue for me, not because I, 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 everybody also identified as blind up here, but I, I mean, I'm sorry, as having a disability up here, but I'm, I'm blind uh, myself. Um, but, you know, one of the things that just happened was I just lost a friend who took his own life because of a lifetime of disadvantages and being pushed and being trying, you know, having to measure up to something that, quite frankly, he was above. He, you know, but nobody paid attention. There was a lot of shame around his depression. He never talked to me about it. His, one of his blind best friends, if anybody knows about disability, it would have been me. Never, never had that conversation. Um, so I'm just saying, mm -hmm. don't feel uncomfortable to have those conversations. If you're sitting in this room, probably one of you out there has a disability that has not disclosed. And I'm not saying you have to be proud of it, you have to disclose it, but just know that, you know, if you're sitting in shame with it, I'm not saying, you know, sitting and kind of like, you know, just being like, you know, this is not that big of a deal. No, but if you're sitting in shame with it, you're, you're also, by not communicating it, kind of bringing shame to it. Um, and I don't know, maybe that sounds judgmental, but that's, that's where I'm at, at at this point in my life. So... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So the pros, like Alex just mentioned, um, is we're interdependent. Mm. Our community is so beautiful in that. You know, for the vaccine, I do it la linea. <laughs> it's free. Yeah, you can get it for free at the pharmacy. You know, it's it's that word of mouth. The booster, oh, you don't know where they're giving it. Let me tell you, nobody has access to it, but I found it. You know, <laughs> and they're very resourceful. Our community is very resourceful. I love that. We empower each other. We find ways. And the same thing goes for disability. You have a child that's struggling. You don't know, let me tell you. I met this person who knows this person who knows this person who has a therapist and can help you. And so our community is so resourceful. But you know what's the sad part? The con is not our community. The con is the system. It is the system. They are the barrier. So our community has to be resourceful. They have no other way or else they don't get ahead or they don't have equity or they don't have fairness. So they have to rely on each other. And that's the sad part. So the con part is what um, the panelists were saying here, that access, you know, it doesn't fall in our community. I often hear uh, say, you know, the Latin community says, oh, you got to pray that away. Or if, if you lose a leg, come on, we, we got this, we got this. But that culture is built on the lack of accessibility to resources. How often are we invited as people of color to panels to speak about the dispersity, the, the discrimination, the racism, but how many, many times, right? But how often are we invited to educate our own community? How often are we invited to provide resources to our community? How often are folks saying, hey, can you turn these resources in Spanish? Can you translate them? You know, um, just the other day, I was talking to the, my cousin who has an autistic baby, and I said, you know that he has rights to IEP, um, the ADA um, supports him. These are laws that protects mm -hmm. a child with disability. ¿Qué es eso? What's that? that? It's not her fault. She don't know. And oftentimes our community doesn't know. When yeah. we talk about our Latin community not accepting disability or not knowing disability, it is the very mere fact that we have barriers and discrimination. 
And when we address that and we actually provide our comunidad mm -hmm. with the resources and the knowledge, I think we're going to see a phenomenal change. I, I agree with Adilsa. And to add, I we need to tell our community about the ADA, Section 504, at a minimum. Minimum. Because a lot of our people don't know the rights, like especially during COVID, like Ajilsa and I were talking about the different treatments available. Same thing goes for like what Ajilsa was saying about having a family member or a caregiver be able to come in with you during COVID was really difficult, but it's a right. And so our communities need to know what we have a right to and to fight for that. Because unfortunately, a lot of the access that we need is not gonna be just given to us if we kindly ask for it. Oftentimes we need to demand it. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna get into, we're running a little bit late here, but we have a few minutes for questions and I believe somebody has a, has a mic here. Yeah, Gabriel. So if you just raise your hand if you have a question for, for the panelists. So I have a really quick question. So I know you're talking about a lot about accessibility to like resources and you know what, how can we make this more clear to our communities? I guess what I wanna ask is, and you touched on it briefly, but what can local, state, and federal policymakers do to make access to like services, activities, and programs and benefits like the ADA and, and other resources like that? Um, how can we make this more accessible to uh, Latino communities that have disabilities or communication challenges? I know this is something that, you know, when we talk about like language barriers to those that, you know, in, in Latino communities that maybe want to access banking or new programs that are coming up, we talk about language, but we kind of forget that there are other communities within our own community that have, you know, issues or uh, they have issues trying to access these as well. So what could policymakers at all three levels do to make this um, more accessible in your view? Or like, what do you think are some solutions? Several things. Um, one, providing information, not just in English, <laughs> translating that information and ensuring that it's reaching to the community. Uh, but when we're talking about access, also ensuring that um, folks who are low income has access. Right now, especially because of COVID-19, and unfortunately, um, folks are waiting one to three years, you can look up at this data, in order to receive therapy. So their child may um, qualify for speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and they're on a waiting list. And so that has to change in itself. And then at the state level, uh, again, um, including us in conversations when we're talking about panels or conferences, but to educate the community, not just about the disproportions or uh, the racism, but actually providing information and resources. Um, I'm just gonna jump on it. And for me, as a blind uh, person, working with blind people, the most important thing is, is it accessible? Can they actually sign up for the services, retrieve the information? If there's some type of image that is necessary in order to explain a scientific process or any process, is it captioned in a way that somebody with blind and low vision can understand it? Um, so that, that is what I feel, in, at least in, in the community that I work with specifically, is probably the most important, making sure that whatever is put out there is accessible. And I would add, you know, tying into what we were saying about community and family, looking for community organizers, looking for community organizations, trying to make family connections if possible. Um, since a lot of our information, like we said, is word of mouth within the community. Thank you. We have time for just, I think you had a question. One more question. Hi, all. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing that. Um, um, Senor Castillo, I'm so sorry to hear about your friend. Um, I hope you're doing well with that. Um, so I'm a student at UC Irvine, and I say that because my question is very theoretical. So um, 
As people who work professionally with the disabled community, I wanted to know your thoughts on the social construction of disability in comparison to the medical model of disability. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, that's for me? No, no, no. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> I was just yeah, laughing because yeah. yeah. you're like Lisa. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the social model has much to... Uh, much is desired from that. I totally agree with that. Um, I think we can take it further. So there is the disability justice model uh, from the West Coast in California that talks more about the need for intersectionality, for cross movement and cross ability organizing, uh, anti capitalism, like. I, I would say that's the direction we need to go, but I also think that the Latino community is also, that framework is a good jumping off point for the disability, disabled Latino community to think of their own framework that is more culturally relevant um, to connect with, I think. Um, there's a lot of good components to the disability justice framework that, especially that focus on intersectionality, about focusing on the most vulnerable within the population. Um, but I also think there are some elements that are more um, based in the Latino culture that could be brought in to kind of strengthen that lens. I, I second the set. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I, I feel the future is disability justice. I think that's where we should be headed. Uh, disability justice takes into consideration intersectionality. So as we mentioned um, at the intersection of LGBTQIA+, and TGNC, transgender, gender nonconforming folks, um, we have to think about um, access and barriers and challenges at those intersections as much as the Latine community. Mm -hmm. And the disability justice does just that. Um, as well as to the previous question, one thing I forgot to mention, which ties into the disability justice module is that policies is created with people in mind. So when you're, they're gonna create a policy, they have meetings and a, a lot of uh, politicians are starting to do this. They have meetings with the community nothing without us. So really considering what does the comunidad have to say? And so that the disability justice um, is that model. They ensure that when they're creating policies at the front end, at the front end who's centered are folks with disabilities who are from the Latin community, but also from diverse community and at all intersections. And so, yeah, I second what uh, Lisette said. I third. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I just, some closing remarks here. Um, again, I'm honored to be among our distinguished panelists and thank you again for the invitation. So a couple things that we kind of reflect on today is what's happened, what continues to happen, and a lot of it has to do with access, the lack of access, booster, vaccination, housing, um, the lack of translators, what's happening in hospitals, focusing really on the rights of people with disabilities, online resources, people that don't have accesses to those online resources, the waiting lists that can be anywhere between one and three years, so important, data collection. And then some of the solutions, you know, isolation therapy that I heard, that's, that's wonderful, um, dis disability justice, the communications that we're having amongst our own community to get the resources that, that we need, but still we need state, uh, local, state, and federal resources for our community, and they, they need to, to listen to, to us. The campaigns, such as a campaign in Puerto Rico, so a lot of things are happening, a lot of moving parts, but we still need to really move forward with that advocacy, and I think together we can, we can go ahead and do that. So with that said, um, I'd like to, to thank again um, Ajilsa Fernandez, Dr. Torres, um, Alex Castillo for, for being with us today, and how about a big hand for them?